Good morning. Um, we are back with our friends from the Division of Parks and Watercraft during our new series of Reptiles and Amphibians. So thanks for joining us this morning. I'm Alyssa Yapel, and I will be helping to moderate today and answer any questions. So um, I'm here with Jenna Winters, who is also going to help answering questions. So folks, utilize your Q&A box, please, if you have any questions to ask our presenters throughout today. And our presenters that we have are Jenny Richards, and then helping her is Josh Pennington. Um, and I also want to give a shout out, you can't see him, but David Parrott with our uh, Division of Forestry has been a huge help today um, on the technology side. You know, we're going to be talking about venomous snakes, so we want to be make sure that safety is our number one concern and, and that Jenny had the support she needed to do this webinar today. So thanks to all of them. Um, and then just a quick preview of what we have coming up throughout the rest of the month. Um, as I said, today is venomous snakes. Then the following week, these are all going to be on two, excuse me, Wednesdays at 10 a.m. throughout the month of September. So next week we have turtles. Following that, we're going to be talking about other sorts of snakes, other Ohio snakes that you might find, but not the venomous ones. Um, and then we'll be talking about frogs um, and salamanders and, and different types of amphibians. And then the final week is vernal pools. So with that being said, I am going to pass it over to Jenny and Josh to say hello, and then they'll get started with a presentation um, before showing you some live venomous snakes later in the show. Jenny? Hi, I'm Jenny. I've been working at Shawnee for about 20 years now, and I'm really excited to be here with you today and share some of my knowledge and uh, this is I'm Josh my name is Josh Pennington um, I'm a recent started naturalist and I'm going to show you guys some venomous snakes at the end of the program so yeah that's about it. Awesome. So, so go ahead girl oh if you want to I know you have a powerpoint that you wanted to start off with today Jenny so yeah. if you want to go ahead and share that um, I'm ready for you so There we go. All right. Can you see it? I can. Um, I can see your whole PowerPoint. So if you just go into presenter mode, we'll be ready. Awesome. OK, so I thought that it would be good to warm you up first because venomous snakes are a topic that it are, is just a really rough topic. Every time I post a picture of a, a copperhead or a rattlesnake, a lot of people, especially from this area, really fear them because the uh, southeastern Ohio is the best place to find them. And um, so I want to start with warming you up and then giving you some ID tips, show you some venomous lookalikes, then share some venomous snake photos and some of their range maps. Now we're going to talk a little bit about conservation programs and what to do if you see one in your yard, what to do if you were to get bitten, and then share some resources with you. So that'll be the way the program goes. So when I say I wanted to warm you up, I, I mean there's no better way than to show a picture of a beautiful rough green snake. If you do not like snakes and you've been conditioned to fear snakes, you would still be just in awe at the beauty of a rough green snake. They're also called a grass snake or a vine snake, and they're really hard to see because they're so wonderfully camouflaged. And they have, uh, they lay eggs. Most of Ohio snakes lay eggs. So these ones lay eggs. This was a venomous, or not a venomous, but a rough green snake that came to the nature center and was actually gravid. And it laid its eggs in the nature center and then we took the eggs. This was a long time ago before I could tell if a snake had eggs in it or not. Now, if someone brought me a rough green snake or if I had a rough green snake and I knew it was gravid, I would put it right back where I got it. But this was a long time ago. So I took the eggs and I put them in some leaf litter behind the nature center and visited those eggs daily with groups of people who visited the nature center. And one day, lo and behold, we scraped back the leaf litter and we saw a baby green snake coming out of the egg. And about 30 people got to witness that with me. So it was really miraculous. So uh, yeah, most of Ohio snakes lay eggs. 
venomous snakes do not. They have live young. So if you've ever heard that venomous snakes and rat snakes are, you know, crossing and you can't trust any snake, that's actually not true. It's not possible. The venomous snakes cannot crossbreed with a rat snake or any other snake. So that's one reason. One has live young, one lays eggs. And how else not to warm you up then with a beautiful photo of a couple of young volunteers, the little girl on the left is holding three snakes, three varieties of snakes in her hand. And she was helping me at the Adams County Fair. Um, she's been a volunteer forever. She's now uh, a senior in, in high school, but she has a brown snake in her hand that's head is heading out of her hand to the left. She's got a red bellied snake in her hand that actually has kind of a reddish color to it. And then she's got a like a slate gray snake in her hand that's got a yellow band around its neck. I don't know if you all can see that, but that's a ring neck snake. And all of those snakes that she's got in her hands are don't grow very large at all. They don't get much larger than a foot. And there she is showing people and she was my volunteer handing me snakes so I could talk about the individual snakes as they came along. And the other young lady also fell in love with snakes, um, was from Dayton and visiting the Nature Center with her grandparents. And she became a volunteer and came back every season. And then she spread the love of snakes. So young people really have an open mind and can help us learn more about things that we fear. So I, I thought this is a good icebreaker. Now we'll get into some great ID tips. So if you are out and about and maybe you're in your garage or your barn and you find a snake shed and you think, oh gosh, is that venomous? What, what do I do? Do I have a venomous snake? You can actually take the shed and you can turn the shed over on its belly and you can pull back towards the cloacal opening is where, where the uh, snake goes potty. And you can see on um, the image where the tail on the image on the left, if you're looking at the screen, the um, scales are divided. They're past the cloacal opening, the scales are divided. So there's two scales going all the way down to the tip. That is from a non-venomous snake. In Ohio, on the belly, past the cloacal opening, the scales are actually divided. On a venomous snake, if you found a shed, you could turn it over. And if the scales were one all the way across the belly, all the way to the very tip of the tail, and they were not divided after the cloacal opening, that would mean, yeah, you have a venomous snake in your garage or barn. So it's something to be a little more concerned about. Another thing to look at is the elliptical pupil versus the circular pupil. So non-venomous snakes in Ohio have circular pupils. Venomous snakes during the day in the light have an elliptical pupil. Now, they actually hunt during the night, especially in the winter time or in the summertime. So at night, their pupil will actually get round. But if you're looking at an image of a, of a snake if in the daylight, if it's got a circular pupil in the image, it is non-venomous. If it has an elliptical or cat slit, it's venomous. And then another thing, which is way easier and and awesome is that from a long distance, if I were walking through the yard or through the woods and I saw a snake from a distance, I could look at it and I could look at the size and shape of the head. Venomous snakes have very large heads because they hold their venom in their jaws. Their venom sacs are in their jaws. So you can actually see where the head ends and the body begins. There's like a narrow little neck. And with Ohio's venomous snakes, which there are only three varieties, they have the really large bodied snakes. They have a big chunky body where most of our most of our non venomous snakes have a narrow head that just kind of fades into body. Although as a defense mechanism, which it's not a great one for them, all snakes can flatten their heads when they're feeling threatened. So they'll flatten their heads. They'll start to shake their tails to try to mimic a venomous snake which is not a good idea because people who don't know snakes very well can sometimes be confused and think, oh my gosh, there's a venomous snake when actually it's a rat snake shaking its tail and flattening its head and trying to appear threatening. So that's, that's a few little tips. Remember those because there's gonna be a quiz. Now, let's look at scales. All of Ohio's venomous snakes have keeled scales. So like a canoe has a keel down the middle, a line through the center of the canoe, at the bottom, venomous snake scales all have a line through the center. So if you find a snake that has shiny, smooth scales, it's not going to be venomous. 
Now that doesn't mean that there aren't some non-venomous snakes in Ohio that actually have killed scales. Like the hognose has killed scales, but that doesn't mean he's venomous. What I'm saying here is if you find a shiny snake, it's not venomous if you're in Ohio. So smooth versus killed. Some, some of Ohio's non-venomous snakes have killed scales. Northern water snakes, hug nose. So don't just think if it's got killed scales or a rough appearance, it's venomous because that's not true. But all of the venomous snakes do have it. I hope I made myself clear on that. So now we'll start with some of our non-venomous lookalikes. And this is a snake that uh, gets killed very often, a very, very common snake in Ohio found throughout. Um, it's the gray rat snake. A lot of us know it as the black rat snake because um, just recently the genetics have been studied and they've split the rat snakes apart into three different sections by studying their DNA. So our Ohio rat snake is now called a gray rat. You can still call it a black rat or a rat. That's just a common name and common names are always confusing. So that is not um, anything to worry about. But rat snakes are awesome animals and they love to hang out in barns. They're the longest of all of Ohio snakes and they um, climb. They'll climb in your barn and they'll eat up all the mice and um, they're really amazing animals. They also unfortunately eat birds and bird eggs. So that's one reason that they like to climb. And you can see in this, these two images, the baby snake or the juvenile snake is also a rat snake and they don't look hardly anything like the adult. So that's something I hear a lot. Oh, we found this baby snake. It doesn't look like a rat snake. It's probably a copperhead or a rattlesnake. Just know that some juveniles do not look like the adult. So this baby rat snake, you can see it's got elliptical pupils and shiny scales. Not elliptical, round. Sorry, I talk fast and sometimes I get ahead of myself. So. What I did is I threw in an image of the uh, Division of Wildlife has an awesome uh, book, uh, Reptiles of Ohio, and it's got the beautiful photos in it. And also it's got range maps. So if you're watching this presentation and you wonder, do rat snakes live near me? Any spot in Ohio that has a dot on it, it is a uh, potential that rat snakes live near you. Now, not everybody is, is recording when they see rat snakes, so this map may be inaccurate. And there's things that you can do, which we'll talk about later, to help make sure that data is um, uploaded into um, a herp mapper so that we know where all these animals are found across the United States. So it's a really cool citizen science thing that you can get involved in. So there's the range map. And you can receive one of these books from the Division of Wildlife. They're free and then you'll have it in your hands ready to go whenever you're looking for snakes or turtles or lizards. So we've got an eastern milk snake. This is another beautiful animal that oftentimes gets confused for a venomous snake. It's got a pattern, but as you can see in this, it's shiny and it's got circular pupils and it can range in um, color a bunch. The babies, the juveniles are beautiful white and red and black. But a great distinguishing characteristic for the milk snake is it almost always has a perfect little heart on the top of its head, a little gray heart that's surrounded by a black outline. They're beautiful. And if, the, if you don't think it's a heart, you might think it looks like a Y, but that's a really cool distinguishing characteristic. Shiny scales, round pupils, not venomous. And then again, I'm showing this just so you'll see how nice the Division of Wildlife's book is and you can look at the range map really quickly. You can also see that milk snakes you know, the size, how big they get, and they have a checkered uh, pattern on their belly. Now, this is one of my all time favorite snakes. Around here, people call them hissing vipers or puff adders, and people are really afraid of them. When you encounter a hog nose, which they're actually fossorial, they live underground and they, they eat toads, you hardly ever see them. But when you encounter one, if it becomes frightened, it starts to flare its neck out like a cobra and hiss at you and do this mock strike where it's going like this with its face, but it never opens its mouth and it always falls short of the target. They're nearly blind. Snakes don't see well. So, you know, they're just trying to scare you and trying to seem like a big scary monster. So you'll leave them alone. Unfortunately, that's what normally gets them killed. And then if that doesn't work, they go to the next defense and that's rolling over on their back and playing dead. And they even musk and rub their musk all over their body so they smell like a dead animal. Very cool animals, something to see. And then you can see the range map, southeastern Ohio mostly, um, but 
as I said earlier, they could be found in more places and we could help update that information if we all were recording. And this is a species of concern, which means it's not very common in Ohio. So those are the ones that I find to be, you know, confused for venomous snakes often, as well as this water snake. The northern water snake, another name for it is a banded water snake. Um, the colors are very variable. Sometimes they're even red and brown and cream colored. You can see it's got a round pupil. It does have keeled scales. I don't know if in that picture you can see there's a line through the center of the scale. So it does have keeled scales. And a lot of folks believe we have water moccasins here in Ohio, but we actually, none have been recorded in Ohio. Now, it's not um, saying that that will never happen. Um, animals' ranges are changing all the time. We're finding animals further north than their normal habitat or their usual habitat all the time. So things are changing and so do animal ranges. But as of now, as far as I know, there have not been any recorded um, cottonmouth or water moccasins in Ohio. But here in Southern Ohio, a lot of people say, I found a water moccasin, I found a cottonmouth, I have it, it's dead. It's unfortunate. Now these guys can be known to be a little cranky. They have a kind of cranky disposition if you try to catch them. But if you don't catch them, try to catch them, they're not gonna bother you. Just leave animals alone and they'll leave you alone. That's really the motto here. Don't bother animals, they won't bother you. And then there's the picture of, and these water snakes actually do have live young. So water snakes, venomous snakes, and any descendant of a water snake has live young. They do, they're not egg, layered, egg layers, so. Here we go, we'll get started with venomous snakes. I'm sorry that took so long to get to, but there, you know, there's a process to learning how to identify. And that's what's really important because so many people bring me a dead snake in a bucket, telling, telling me they killed a copperhead and it was a milk snake or a hog nose, or, and I get so sad. So I'm trying to help you understand a little more so that you can not make those mistakes and understand also the importance of snakes in the ecosystem. We need these animals, they they're for pest control. They help eat lots of insects and also lots of mice and rats. So here we go with the most beautiful reptile in Ohio, the copperhead, and it got its name because it's always got a copper colored head. Great name. You can tell the copperhead by, you can see it's got elliptical pupils, a copper colored head. It's also got hourglasses, dark colored hourglasses that run the course of its body. The hourglasses, actually the dark hourglasses touch the ground. You can see in this juvenile and in the adult snake that the hourglasses go all the way to the ground. Where in a northern water snake, that's not always the case. In a milk snake, that's not always the case. Now here's another really great photo to teach you something about juveniles and grown um, snakes that don't get bigger than a foot long. This is a baby copperhead in this image. And I hope you can see that it's got a fluorescent greenish yellow tip on the tail. It will have that for the first two to three years of its life. And it's basically a lure. It's gonna lie there and wait with that tail there, wiggling it slowly, hoping for a fence lizard or a ground skink to come by or a little bug to think that it's something it can eat and then it's gonna get it. So another myth that I've heard a lot is that juvenile snakes are more dangerous than adult snakes. Um, that's actually not true at all. Juvenile snakes do have um, more toxic venom and they do give it all. They, they don't, they can't really shut off a valve. Like a grown venomous snake can give the amount of venom that they need to, to kill their prey or not give any at all, which has been really cool that um, scientists and doctors have been finding that most venomous snake bites, the majority of them to humans are dry bites. They do not administer venom. Why would they want to waste that valuable, precious protein that they have to make in order to, um, survive on something too big to eat. So, and there's been no recorded deaths from copperhead bites in Ohio. And the only way that you're gonna die from a copperhead bite is if you have a, a severe allergic re reaction and, and anaphylactic shock or something like that. It's very rare for people to die of copperhead bites. So there's that. You can calm down and relax. I could take my own advice. Okay. So here we are with the range map again. As you can see, copperheads are mostly an unglaciated southeastern Ohio snake, and you probably won't have them in, in your area, but they are really beautiful and fun to see. Okay, these are my favorite of all. I just love the timber rattlesnake. It's becoming very rare in Ohio, and it desperately needs our help. It's um, a mature forest animal, and there's only a couple places in Ohio left that the timber rattlesnake is thriving. And Shawnee Forest is one. Vinton 
County is another, Tarhalo. Those are great places where the timber is still thriving. In most places, they used to be found in like 22 counties and now it's down to nine. So their range is, is shrinking down and they get killed all the time when they're crossing the road. Snakes love to bask in the road. It helps warm up their bellies and, and then help them digest their food. And so they're out there in the road and most people who fear snakes and loathe snakes because their parents taught them that as a young at a young age. And it's also a survival thing. We probably came out with a little bit of that in us, you know, hey, we need to survive, so let's watch out for things that have venom. So it's, it's not your fault if you're afraid, but it's always a good idea to keep learning and opening your mind and realizing that all of these animals, even if you have fear for them, they deserve respect and they have a place in the ecosystem that is very, very important. And without them, it's, it's a broken puzzle and we need all the pieces of the puzzle. I don't know about you, but I throw puzzles away that are missing a piece and uh, we need all the pieces. So let's help protect these beautiful, beautiful species that are long lived. They've been recorded to live 45 years in captivity. And we're gonna show you one here in a little bit. If I don't talk too long, keep me in check. Let me know if I am going too long. So these are the neonates. Those are baby timber rattlers, which is a really cool thing to get to see. And they look just like the adult. You can see the elliptical pupil, the giant head. And these are all photos taken right here in Shawnee. And then this picture is the picture of the timber rattler you're gonna get to see here in a little bit in the yard that's out getting some exercise right now and letting some rain drop on his beautiful skin. So he's, he's out there exercising, waiting for his part of the show. But that's him, his name's Timber. He was born in captivity in 1990, so he's an old guy. And you can see the range is very, very limited. And then here's one I've never seen in the wild. I'd love to see a Massasaga and they have a very limited range and they're also, you know, found in little wetland areas, um, extremely rare in Ohio. And another name for them is a swamp rattler. They have real short fangs and uh, nothing to be feared. You know, the best way to uh, avoid getting bitten by any snake is just don't pick up snakes. Um, this is a crazy fact, but about five, people per year die of venomous snake bites in the whole North America. People think it's this huge number. More people die in plane accidents, car accidents. About five people a year die of venomous snake bites. And they're mostly inebriated uh, men between the ages of 30 and 50. So they're people who are trying to be cool, handle venomous snakes, and that's always just a bad choice. Don't do it. And um, yeah, you'll be safe if you don't pick up venomous snakes. And there's that beautiful little guy. Look how cute that little fella is. Someday I'm gonna to get to see one of those in the wild. And you can see a very limited and spotty distribution on that range map. But look, only 18 inches long. Wouldn't you just love to see one of those? All right, quiz time. What do we see? We got, uh, we got smooth, shiny scales. Is this venomous or not venomous? What do they think, Alyssa? If anybody has any um, guesses, you can type it in the Q&A box. We'll do this. We'll go through the quiz and then we'll have people like answer if they want to and at the end. Sure. But or you can just give quiz yourselves at home, whatever. <laughs> I'll tell you that is non venomous shiny scales, right? Now look at this. This is a close up of some scales. You can see that they have the line in the middle, so they're keeled. So this could be either way, right? This could be venomous or not venomous. I want to put in this little bit of information that I found from an art teacher who was talking to me one day and she said that the mosaic was inspired by snake scales. You can see all these scales. Mosaic art was inspired by scales. So snakes are part of our natural history, our cultural history. This is actually a close up of copperhead scales. All right, look at the cloacal opening there. Just past that. The scales split to two, divided scales after cloacal opening. What do we think, venomous or non? I, I bet you're getting it right. That's actually the belly of a ring neck snake, non-venomous. We did have some folks that answered that correctly and same with the one before. Awesome. Now this is a trick question here. Is this a venomous snake or not? This is a trick, remember, but look at the color of the head. This is the coolest anomaly ever. A friend of mine who you know, retired from the Division of Wildlife took this picture and it is actually a copperhead with no marks. 
So there's exceptions to every rule. Look at that thing. Isn't that amazing to get to see that? So they found this this uh, anomaly twice in the same region. This was, I think, in maybe I shouldn't even say. I'll just leave it alone. <laughs> okay. So this is hemipenes. This is uh, reproductive organs of uh, male snakes have two reproductive organs, and this is showing the hemipenes. But that's not really why I have this image in there. I have this image there because of the tail. You can see one scale, one scale, one scale, cloacal opening, and then the end is still one scale all the way to the tip. That tells us something if we find a shed and it's one scale on the belly all the way to the tip. Most Talk people are saying venomous. That's right. You guys are awesome. OK, and now at the end, I'm just going to share a few little photos of things that um, have happened over the years that um, are moving and wonderful. This little girl, Isabella, is now a college student, and she wanted to come to the Nature Center for her birthday. It was a very quiet Sunday, and I had the rattlesnake out on the rocks to get some exercise, and she showed up. And here she is with her mother, and they're enjoying this beautiful, beautiful rattlesnake timber who was born in 1990. It's not a wild snake. He's born in captivity. And he, we let him get out in the grass to exercise sometimes because he's an old man and he needs exercise and he needs sunlight. It's not a great idea to throw animals in cages and walk away. I mean, you, you have to properly care for animals if you're going to have them. It's a big responsibility. And um, I actually have a permit from the Division of Wildlife. It's an educational permit that we have to go through to make sure that everything's, you know, good and we're following all the rules. But Isabella is, and around her pencil that I gave her for her birthday, she has a bait, she has a little brown snake wrapped around that pencil. She just fell in love with snakes at the Nature Center. And this is a charismatic rattlesnake that we got in the wild um, under someone's house. They caught it and put it in a bucket. They were my neighbor and they called me and said, Jenny, there was a rattlesnake under my house. Please come get it. And I did go get it and then waited for the scientists to come pick it up, measure it, weigh it, put a transmit, not a transmitter. We did not track the snake. We just put a little number chip in it, released it in case we ever recaptured it because anything that's critically endangered in Ohio, some scientists is studying it to try to protect its habitat. So this was just a beautiful photo. We put it out in the grass behind the Nature Center to get a photo to present to the governor. Um, and it rested its head on this little bullet mushroom. Isn't that beautiful? See? Got personality, right? Does this make you feel so in love with this beautiful rattlesnake? It does me. All right, some threats um, and conservation are snake fungal disease, which is something that's been around for a long time now. And it's a fungus that gets on the scales of the snake and it's been killing a lot of rattlesnakes across their range, especially rattlesnakes, but almost all snakes can, can get it. But there are some species that are more prone to it and it basically just messes up their scales really bad and then they can't see and they can't eat. Um, hopefully that they'll shed it off and they'll be fine, but that's not always the case. So keeping snakes in captivity or catching and releasing can be a dangerous thing for people to be doing because we can be spreading around that snake fungal disease. It say, so you're really into herps and you love to catch snakes and you like to take their pictures or whatever. Say you go to hawking and you get snake fungal disease on your equipment, and then you go down to Shawnee and you bring it down to the rattlesnake population. You're not allowed to ever pursue rattlesnakes too, by the way. You, you're not even for photos. They're so critically um, rare that that's even against the law. But what, what I'm saying is we gotta really think about the things that we do as humans because we can spread diseases just like white nose syndrome with bats. So we have to, we're, we have to be responsible. And um, loss of habitat is another problem. So we wanna make sure that we're always creating habitats in our own yard. I have log piles out the wazoo at my place and rock piles. I actually put out metal tins and in the end, you're gonna get to see a cute little two minute video of my daughter and my son and I flipping tins yesterday to try to find you a copperhead and a milk snake on video. And then there's illegal harvesting. People actually take animals from the wild and then sell them. What? You gotta be kidding me. Why would anyone do that? I mean, this is their home. This is where they live. We gotta leave animals be in their natural habitat. It's our responsibility. Um, and if you find one on your land, as long as it's not in your house, just, and you're scared, walk away or call an official, call me, uh, we'll help you out. And then environmental pollution and um, introduced and invasive species can be problems with, um, especially amphibians. Um, things you can do to help learn more and become more comfortable as volunteer. Look at this rock filled with young kids holding snakes and and uh, these most of these kids are in college now. This is kind of an old picture, but you can volunteer to learn more. You can volunteer and do citizen science to help like 
you know, update the data. We had a herpetology weekend at Shawnee and 115 people came to go out and look for reptiles and amphibians in Shawnee. And we found over one weekend's time, every species that could be found in the forest here. It was a really wonderful event. So organizing events to raise awareness is really an important thing that we can do as people. Talk to school kids and it doesn't have to be an educator. It doesn't have to be an environmental educator or a naturalist. It can be you. You can be the one to make the change. Talk to all the kids in your neighborhood. If you're a snake person, take kids to go flip some rocks and look around and show them how awesome these animals are because it starts when we're young. That's where we start to learn. Um, science camp, we have a science camp and this scientist, Doug Wynn, came and he anesthetized a snake and he put a transmitter in, in the snake and all the kids got to enjoy this science activity with Doug, um, learning more about the timber rattler and that was a really cool event. And there we are, um, every time a snake, a wild snake is caught crossing the road in the region um, by one of us, by a naturalist or a state um, official, a government official, we would pick up the snake, we would put it in a bucket safely, um, and then we would call Doug in this area and he would measure and weigh and put a small transmitter in the snake, just a number chip, that way if it's recaptured, we can study you know, how the population is doing. So that's something that's been done in the, in the past and still happening today with even another scientist in the Vinton Experimental Forest. So handling and bite treatment. This is kind of boring here at the end, but it might be something you want to know. Um, and, and Josh is going to show some of that at the end. What we use is, is hooks and tongs and um, we're very cautious. We keep the, the snake away from our bodies. These are two snakes that were caught right in Shawnee. That one on the bottom was the biggest female snake I ever saw in my life. So um, for bite treatment, this is what a bite can look like. This is actually a picture uh, taken, a friend of mine actually got bitten um, by a copperhead on his finger, uh, actually twice you can see. He was a research student and he's studying and you can see he got too close and he did it two times in a row. So this is what it looks like. Uh, he never even had to receive any antivenom because uh, it was a copperhead bite, but it did swell up. It looks terrible. Um, these are some of the things that happen when you do become bit by a snake, you get the two puncture wounds. My uncle's dog was just bitten by a, a rattlesnake this week, last week while he was picking berries and uh, the snake, the dog did not die, but it didn't need antivenom, but it was a bad situation. I mean, you gotta be really careful if you're in a place where venomous snakes are. You have to watch where you're stepping, wear long boots if you're walking through tall grass, all that stuff. It's about us taking the proper precautions to keep ourselves safe. And then this is a whole lot of information and I only put it up there for a second and this is my last slide besides the short video. But the, the point is, don't use a tourniquet anymore. All the old school ways of you know handling snake bites are not accurate anymore. You don't suck out the venom, none of that. What you do is you contact 911 immediately and you go, you know, go to the doctor and they look at your wound and then you'll either receive any venom or you won't. If you if you did receive the uh, venom in the bite, you, they would treat you. But like I said, the majority of snake bites to humans are non, they're dry bites. They don't even give it to us. So I have a two minute video if you if I have time to share it here at, at the end. Here's some resources, the Reptiles of Ohio book that is uh, put out by the Division of Wildlife, which I showed you some images from. Um, the Ohio Biological Survey has some wonderful posters and books also, which are very scientific. And then I told you about Herp Mapper, www.herpmapper. That's for if you want to, you know, map things that you see in your yard and send it to the Herp Mapper. It's an it's a app for your phone. It's really super cool. And then if you want to get involved and learn more, there's a wonderful um, organization. I'm actually on the board of this organization, Ohio Park. It's Ohio Partners in Amphibian and Reptile Conservation. There's an annual conference and they have a website. And so really super cool. And here's my video if I can get it to play. I hope there's sound. We are flipping tins for you. Don't think we have the sound, Jenny, but it might be fine without it. Too late to get the sound, isn't it? Can you still hear me? Well, that was a beautiful beetle. 
that we found under the first pin. So I have these pins set out along the perimeter of my property. And um, sometimes you don't find snakes under them. That's what they're for. But I found this beautiful uh, purple beetle under there. And I just wanted to share that with you so you find other things. Under this pin, you can see my daughter is taking the video. That's two northern copperheads gestating females under that tin. My son's standing right next to me. My daughter is taking the video. So that's a car hood that I have. And um, the there's going to be baby copperheads. The copperheads are only gregarious when they are gestating. Uh -huh. and, yeah. So that's pretty cool. I wish you could hear the sound. It's pretty cute. There's the last pin we flipped, and we got a milk snake yesterday, which is one of the snakes that I think are uh, oftentimes confused for copperheads. And there I caught it so I could bring it and share it with you guys here today. And basically, that, that's the gist of my program. And I hope I left some time for Josh to talk because he's going to share some live snakes with you and and when nature centers get back going again, we'd love to see all of you visiting our nature centers and, and sharing some of these animals in a more up close and personal way. That's Ren. We'll flip to Josh now. All right, awesome. Um, sending you live, Josh. Can you see me? I can see you, yeah. All right, come here, Hunter. Uh, this is one of our volunteers, Hunter. She is my daughter. Um, she has a very neat snake. Can I have it? This is an Eastern Black King snake. Um, Jenny referred to uh, scales being killed scales or smooth scales. Um, this snake here has very smooth scales. Um, this is a very neat snake. Um, I'm not sure how much time I have remaining. Um, You're good on time. Don't worry. Okay, terrific. This snake right here is actually really unique on the fact that it actually eats venomous snakes. Um, so some people refer to it as a good snake because of that reason. Um, he's a very neat snake. Um, he's black and he has these uh, distinguished kind of spots along the side on the lower dorsal part. You want to go put him back for me? Okay. Thank you very much. I'm going to get out another snake really fast. Can you see us okay? Okay. Yeah. This is another volunteer. This is my son, Josh. Um, JJ. Uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, this is a gray rat snake. This is Ohio's lo uh, longest snake. Um, it usually gets like six feet, um, but they can reach over eight feet long. Um, the longest one I know of on record is over eight feet in captivity, so they sh I'm sure they get longer in the wild. Um, very docile snake, as you can tell. They're excellent climbers. And then unlike Mr. King um, with the dorsal scales, this has killed scales. Um, I'm not sure if you'll be able to tell, but like in Jenny's slideshow, it has the, the little slit there in the middle. And they rise up kind of like the shingles on uh, your roof is one way I like to refer to that. How uh, they like overlay. She's a little, she's really active. Oh, yeah. yeah. You want to put Shadow up for me? Yeah. And they can strip and they're very strong. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Okay, I want to make sure I had time to pull out the venomous snake because that's kind of what the program's all about. So I'm going to get him out really quickly. Oh, yeah, so yeah. Was, just to clarify, so those snakes that we just saw were non venomous. Non venomous, I'm sorry. Yeah. Non <laughs> yes, non venomous. And how, how much time do we got? How much time out? do we have? You're good on time. Don't worry about it. I'll, I'll let you know if we're getting close. Well, Jenny's slideshow pretty well pointed out all the differences between a non-venomous and venomous. But I wanted to show something 
usually when people find is a shed like they'll be uh, in their garage or out in the barn and they find a shed out in their yard and they want to know is this venomous or non-venomous so well, they can tell right away just from the shed and i brought a few i'm not sure how well it's going to do on the camera but if you can see does that look good mm -hmm. the, yeah the on divided that jenny showed in the slideshow and then past the cueca it starts to divide all the scales all along the tail it goes one two one two one two that is divided look good on the yeah. screen yeah now i'm going to pull out a venomous snake and you can tell just by the shed there is the cueca and you can see past it never divides it stays all the way across with no divides mm -hmm. so if you find a shed like this in your yard here in ohio you can guarantee that this is a venomous snake and the other one is a non-venomous because usually people find sheds and that's what they usually bring to us at the nature center to see if they have a copperhead or what let me get him out Now this is your timber rattlesnake. As you can see, he has kind of the diamond shaped head. And then the rattle, which out of the three venomous snakes we have in Ohio, two of them has rattle. Um, the copperhead's the only one that does it. They all have the triangular shaped head or the arrow head shaped head. And then I'm not sure if he's gonna let you see his face or not. But as Jenny's slideshow right showed, front, yeah, he's got pits in the front with, along with nostrils. And then the beautiful pattern. Th this is probably, in my opinion, one of Ohio's beautiful reptiles. He is just gorgeous. Um, the, ven the venomous snakes are uh, definitely beautiful. Yeah, and the copperhead as well, which we do not have with us today. But as you can see, they're they're pretty docile. Uh -huh. um, they don't move very quickly. They're very sluggish, um, not aggressive. They will hold their ground by being defensive. Did all of you get to see him shudder his head when Josh had him on the ground? His nose actually got tickled by the grass, and sometimes when Timber's out on the ground, his nose gets tickled and he shakes his head really fast. I, I've even seen him almost like sneeze like it yeah. seems like because of it. Yeah. Yeah. So just so everyone's clear, this is this is a snake that was born in captivity. This snake was born in 1990. He's never been in the wild. He's an old guy. If this was a wild snake, it would not be behaving like this. It would be trying to get away. It would be trying to escape. And so it'd just be moving forward, moving forward. And of all the years, I was saying earlier, I've been doing this for 20 years. And uh, working closely with uh, Doug Wynn, um, with timber rattlers, I have never had a timber rattler try to strike at me. All they want to do is get away. Um, so they're very docile snakes. They are um, not anything that you would want to try to pick up or try to catch on your own. But Josh has a tub out here, a tote. Yeah. You can just show you them the tote and you can. So a tote with a lid. And I was going to leave it out. So go, you can go ahead and explain, Jenny, if you want to. I'll, uh, I can even we demonstrate. We don't even have to demonstrate, yeah. but what we're saying is if you do find a venomous snake in your yard and you have fear and you need help, the first thing you need to do is get on get online and get a hold of the Division of Wildlife. And there's a wildlife officer in every county in all of Ohio. So the first thing you need to do is contact the wildlife officer. They will know who can help you remove the rattlesnake if, or copperhead. If it's on your front porch if it's just out in the woods just get a picture of it take a picture and say wow i gotta see a rattlesnake or a copperhead today what a great experience but if it's in a place that's making you uncomfortable like the garage the porch then you're going to want to reach out to someone from the division of wildlife 
And there's a website, you can call 1-800-WILDLIFE, or they have their own website, and each uh, district has a district office, and they'll be able to help get a hold of an officer for you to help you uh, manage your situation. So the last resort would be to put it in a tub yourself. But if you ha could not reach anyone, and you had one on your porch, you wanted to put it in a safe place so there wouldn't be on your front porch that you have small children and you're nervous, you could put a tote on its side, and then a broom actually works really nicely. I like a push broom myself if you have one, but it just you don't even have to shove him in. You just kind of guide his head in, and he will go right in there all by himself. I should have left the snake out to demonstrate this, but once the snake gets up inside, you just simply flip it up. A taller is better, so if you have like a 30-gallon trash can, that would really, really work well. We just used this coat for demonstration because we didn't have a true clean trash can. But taller is better. <laughs> And then when you're putting on the lid, you're going to stand back. Yep, stand back. Hands out of the way, right here, and then just let it drop right on there. And then you can secure it into place. But that's not something we're, we're saying we think you should do. I mean, yeah. that should be left to the official. Yes. And, but, it, you know, we know, we understand that sometimes, especially in regions where, where rattlesnakes are really prevalent. Here, yes. Yeah, in Shawnee, we get a lot of people saying, I've got a rattlesnake on my front porch. What do I do? And if Josh and I are around we get a phone call we would be happy to go and help and yeah. so would any naturalist who works in a region where there's venomous snakes there so um and when we have i've had, had calls where they've been underneath the porch and uh, the couple was too afraid to even exit the the front of their house with their back of their porch was being uh, um, redone so the front of their house was at the time was the only way in and out of the house and they were too afraid to leave because they had two venomous snakes underneath their porch and they knew that they were there because they walked out and seen them Slide right under, called us, and we came out and got them pretty. They were excited about it. So, and, and now they've learned that the rattlesnakes are okay, and they've kind of um, kind of fallen in love with them. Uh, yeah, they really have. Yeah, they yeah, actually they're, they're, have. Yeah, they have. And they've seen many rattlesnakes since then, and now they know what to do. We actually taught these individuals how to put them in a bucket because they had so many. There must be a den really close to their house, and they're, luckily they're not people who. Um, hate that. They love it. They think it's really cool. They want to help protect the, the animal and its habitat. And that's just so important that even if there's something that you fear or you loathe, the best thing you can do is educate yourself. Learn more. Go to the library. Pick up a book. What you'll find is, like I said earlier, five. the average is five per year in all of North America deaths from venomous snake bites in Ohio. More people buy a, die of bee sting of ungulate attacks, which is the hooved animals, like if you're a deer hunter, a deer attacks more people doing rut than a rattlesnake ever would. So just learn more and, and get to know all of your Ohio wildlife and fall in love because there's nothing better than getting to see wild animals in their natural habitat. It, it, uh, so I have a question um, and I do want to just remind um, um, anybody that's anybody watching, watching, if you, if you do have questions, go ahead and type them in the Q&A. Okay. But somebody had asked, um, can you talk about the difference in venomous and poisonous? A lot of people commonly use the terms interchangeably, but there, there is a difference. I, there is a difference, but I never, I'm okay with either term. So poisonous is okay by me, just like venomous, because um, the definition is kind of vague. And um, poisonous will work, but if I was going to be technical about it, um, the poison is something that you ingest or touch, like uh, poisonous mushrooms or, or poison frog. ivy or frogs, salamanders. salamanders, since we're on reptiles and amphibians, yes. Um, and the venom is something that is injected um, into the bloodstream. Um, Spiders and snakes both yeah. have fangs and use venom. Yes. But we do have a few um, animals that are poisonous in Ohio. The red spotted newt is one of them. Don't go eating red spotted newts, whatever you do. And the pickerel frog yeah. actually has venom. It's got a bright yellow wash under its thigh. When it hops, you can see this yellow coloration. Lots of times, really colorful things are poisonous, yeah. toxic. So there, there is a difference between poison and venom. But most people around here, my daughter yesterday, when I flipped the tin and we found the two copperheads, she said, those are poisonous. And I said, venomous. So some people are real sticklers about it. Some people are laid back about how you say it. And they are. And, and I was talking about worldwide. There are, like the venomous snakes, there are poisonous snakes as well. Um, the tiger-killed snake is one. Um, it's venomous and poisonous. 
Um, and it's, it gets its poison from the, the diet, the uh, poisonous frogs it eats. Um, it develops the glands on the back of the neck, and it will even swing its head around and try to hit a, a predator with the poison glands on the back of its head. So it's very aware that it is poisonous, and it has rear-facing things, so it, does, it is venomous as well. But um, that's something that isn't here in Ohio, of course. But I, I hear that a lot of people say, well, is it poisonous? And they're like, no, it's venomous. I, I, I try not to correct people too much because I, I think either term works. Um, I think either one's fine. Yeah. Um, I don't have anything more to really add that I know of unless we have some more uh, questions. Um, let's see. Um, can you mention the anticoagulant in a northern water snake saliva? I'd love, I love to demonstrate it for people when we are flipping tins. That you bleed you, pretty bad. Yeah, you, you can bleed, uh, bleed pretty bad. And um, they're made to hold on. They, they got pretty good hardware um, for not being a non-venomous snake. They're made to hold on to slippery stuff like fish and stuff. So they, they can penetrate pretty good when they lay into you. And you bleed pretty bad. For people. <laughs> <laughs> the Lake Erie water snake. I, I had a friend that did the... Uh, um, conservation efforts up there and they would go up and just pull up the side of the boat and just grab as many of the cans for the tagging program and uh, they show me some pictures of them bleeding pretty well as well. Okay. Any, any questions? Well I think you guys did an awesome job because we don't, um, Jenna and I had answered some questions throughout but um, I think you guys covered pretty much everything so Thank you both. Um, Je Jenny or, or Josh, do either of you have anything before we wrap up? Um, no, um, thanks for the volunteers. I, I brought my kids today as volunteers, but the volunteers that help us out at Shawnee, uh, out at Shawnee really make a huge difference. So I just want to thank the volunteers out, out at the state park. That they're still out there doing stuff around the park, even though we ain't having any programs or anything. Uh, they're still helping picking up trash and, and just little things. Yeah. It makes a difference. I want to second that. Thanks yeah. to all the volunteers who help us at Shawnee State Park because we really mm -hmm. take pride in, in having these animals and, ha and taking proper care of them. Putting animals in little boxes and walking away is just not acceptable and it's a big responsibility to have a pet. So if you fall in love with snakes as a kid and you want to keep a snake, you've got to change the water daily. You've got to take care of those animals. Make sure they're getting everything they need. And for Josh and I, we believe they need, uh, we believe they need light. Um, and sunlight, like we all need sunlight. Don't we all get sad in the winter time when we, when we are lacking vitamin D? And you can do that by putting light in your cage. So make sure that you, you use everything that you need to if you have a pet snake out there. And please use both of us as a resource. We're yeah. easy to find. We have government email addresses and we would love to ha you know, answer any questions you have in the future and be, be of help in any way that we can because um, we are your natural. <laughs> awesome. We have a lot of thank yous coming in to both of you. Um, I do see Taylor had wrote in um, and asked, if you see a poisonous snake, what do you do? So could you just clarify, are, is that poison, poisonous snake you mentioned in Ohio snake? Is Are those found in Ohio or um, or not? No, no, uh, the poisonous snakes are, aren't, it, it, it's venomous, but it, it, I'm okay with the term poisonous. So poisonous to me would be just fine with the copperhead, the timber rattle, or the massasauga. Um, venomous poisonous, um, as long as we know um, what they are and, and conservation efforts towards them, how important they are to uh, the environment. They're a keystone species. Okay. Um, and uh, Bill asks for emails. So Jenna, would you be able to post their emails in the Q&A um, and then so thank you all uh, for the Jenny and Josh for the presentation, um, Jenna for answering questions and David for helping with the technical stuff. I do just want to um, to wrap up let you know as a reminder what we have coming um, ahead and um, as I mentioned we will be talking about let me pull up my document here so I don't forget turtles um next week then we have ohio snakes frogs and salamanders and toads and then last week we have vernal pools so once again those are going to be wednesdays at 10 a.m um, we do have a second series that we are going to be starting next 
Tuesday at 10 a.m. And that is going to be our logging on series with forestry. And so we're going to talk about the history of Ohio forests and the evolution of forest cover, um, tree ID, and wildfire prevention. Who doesn't love hearing from um, some advice from Smokey Bear? We might hear that. So I hope you will join us in the coming webinars and I hope you enjoyed today. So take care. Thanks.